Now, our guest host for this evening's event is Rich Folley. I have known Rich for many years, dating back to my days at Borders Corporate Office, and I recall many passionate conversations with Rich about books and authors and the publishing industry. He has interviewed countless authors during his tenure at Borders, as well as in his current capacity um, at Bibliostar dot tv where he is the founder and ceo um, and that is an entertainment organization for readers and most recently rich took on the role as the executive producer of the internationally recognized and perhaps one of the most well-respected book uh, fairs in the world the miami book fair international tonight marks his fourth appearance on the national writer series stage as a guest host now, Rita Mae Brown, let me tell you, I could spend a lot of time up here right now telling you about all of the incredible things that she's done in her life and all of her amazing books, as well as a lot of fun that we've had since she arrived in town last night. <laughs> but I am just going to suffice it to say that we're going to let most of those stories unfold right here when she walks out onto the stage. Um, now, I was an English major in college, but it really wasn't, in, and an avid reader, but it really wasn't until I became a bookseller that I first discovered Rita Mae Brown. And I can still visualize the exact spot on the bookshelf where we shelved her books because I walked so many people to that spot that came in inquiring about her, or I directed people to that location when they were looking for a particular book. Um, it, uh, her books include the critically acclaimed Ruby Fruit Jungle, which was only uh, one of many accomplishments in her extraordinary career, a career in which she has not only written several New York Times bestsellers, but also one that has seen her active in causes including civil rights, the Vietnam War, gay liberation, and feminism. She has published nearly a book a year since the 1970s and has generated a daunting body of work. She holds doctorate degrees in literature and political science, and she lives in Virginia with cats and hounds and horses and a lot of other animals. This evening, we have been fortunate enough to lure her away from her farm in Virginia to the National Writer Series stage so she can share her stories with all of us. Please join me in welcoming Rich Folley and the amazing Rita Mae Brown. Thank you. <laughs> I think we will. <laughs> How fun. It's so great to have you in Traverse City. Thank you. Thank National Writers Series. Thank everybody. <laughs> These are the modern inconveniences. Yeah, we can work it out. Uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, I've, I've been so excited for this day and I've been reading all about you and I've been have all these great things to talk about and uh, we got here and within 15 minutes we were talking about uh, Chris Everett, Norman Lear, The Charge of the Light Brigade, poems by John Milton, um, Shirley Chisholm and that was like in the green room right there I mean, that was all in like five minutes. Uh, I think what I found out is that we're going to have a really fun conversation and I just want to try to open the door and get out of the way as much as I can because you've lived a fascinating life. I do want to try to put some structure on it though, and I thought I'd try to do that, sort of like how you do it with your books. You have the humans section, and then you have the <laughs> animals section. So I thought we'd maybe try to split it in half. And uh, I thought we would start with animals, uh, because it seems to me you start with animals often uh, as it is. Uh, Let Sleeping Dogs Lie is your ninth book in the Sister Jane Arnold fox hunting mystery series. Um, you write these wonderful other books with Sneaky Pie Brown as your cat collaborator. We'll talk about those too. But let's start with the fox hunting thing because we did lure you from your farm and you have a fox hunt coming up yourself. And Sister Jane is, uh, is a fox, is a MFH. And maybe you can explain what that is and explain your own role on the fox hunting. Master of Foxhounds, MFH. And Sister Jane is 73 in this particular book. And she's a character that fascinates me because she's had a major losses in her life. Um, she's had a, a financially secure life, so that, you know, that part of life was easy, but she lost her son to a farming accident when he was 14. That was 1974, I think. And then her husband passed a few years after that. So she suffered. Um, Americans have a curious idea that money uh, softens suffering. It does not. 
You know, pain, pain doesn't pick classes or races to uh, focus on. We all get our share. Or as Mama said, oh, honey, we all wind up in the kitchen, and, uh, Sorrow's kitchen, and lick all the pots clean. So she fascinates me a lot. And of course, I fox in it in my mother's womb. I don't remember it, but there I was. So it's, it's really part of, I mean, I knew all this before I knew language, before I could read. So it's, in a way, it's the oldest part of me. And you're, when you're putting on these things, you're, you're, as MFH, you're the person putting on the entire hunt. You're also the, hunt, you're also the huntsman. All that is different. As you read these books, you, you enter a world that most people don't know, and it's this incredibly deep and detailed world that you live with in so much responsibility. I don't know how you find time to write. Well, I don't know. I, I just do everything that I can, but what I love about fox hunting is the partnership with the animals. You know, it, it's kind of like, you all love Fred and Ginger movies, don't you? I mean, I assume you do. And by the way, is it true that the first resident of this city said, lead me not into temptation, I can find it myself? <laughs> I hope it's true. That's why I came here. Um, but at any rate, at any rate um, you're out there, and so... Fred and Ginger. If you're a female, you're Ginger. Well, Fred's a horse. So you're dancing with this animal. And of course, if you're male, it, it's the reverse. And I'm the huntsman, so I'm controlling the hounds. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll take out 40, 50, depending on, on what you've got and who's fit. But it's musical. You communicate through music. And most people don't realize that. It's beautiful. The sounds are beautiful. So I'm calling to them on the horn, and they're responding. And if we find a fox scent, they call, it's what's called opening. And they speak. And then they all sing at once. And I don't care who you are. I don't care if you think we're awful brutes. We're not. We don't kill foxes. But that sound will make the hair stand up on the back of your of your neck. It's so fabulous. And we've been doing this for thousands of years. It's one of the oldest things humans do, is hunt with hounds. It's kind of cool. And a lot of people do think you kill the foxes, but you don't. And it's different than in, the, in England where they do hunt foxes, but you guys just chase foxes, basically. We couldn't get them even if we wanted to. They're too smart. You know, I mean, the truth is they're too smart. But uh, it, is, it is interesting how these misconceptions go on and groups like PETA make sure they go on, you know. Yeah. That, that's, you just deal with it. Well, the books, in, in your books, there's a cornucopia of characters. There's, an, you know, this huge group of people. In fact, there's so many characters that you have two Jane Arnolds in the book. You have Jane Arnold's sister and then OJ, the other Jane. And that's probably one of the few books where you have two characters with the same name, just for the sake of... Well, there's a real OJ. I had to do that. Oh, that's there's funny. a real Jane White. It's funny. But every one of you should have something that you love that isn't reasonable, that isn't going to make you any money, but makes you more alive than anything else you could do in the world. I don't care if it's bridge, I don't care if it's golf, I don't care whatever it is. But this idea that everything we do, this puritanical idea that everything we do should be purposeful and good. Oh, honey, it's so tedious. <laughs> As we say down south, cut a shine, do something, just live. And for you, a big part of that is the animals themselves. I mean, what I, what I love about reading the book and what I love about the life that you describe when you're fox hunting is that these animals have voices. And in fact, not only do you have characters in your books that are talking all the time that you have to keep track of, but all the animals have personalities, all the hounds have personalities and have conversations and the fox and the horses. But in your real world, as you've described it, you have that same kind of thoughts about them. They're all communicating with you, and you understand their personalities really well. Well, think about this. Agriculture is only t 10, maybe 14,000 years old. Before that, we survived by hunting. You and I are medium-sized predators. Our eyes are in the center of our head. We focus like this. And in order to survive, we had to have good hand-eye coordination. And we had to learn to communicate with one another. I'm convinced language developed from hunting. Um, if you're a prey animal, your eyes are on the side of your head, so you can see all around you. And your defense is either to stay absolutely still or to run. Um, so we made the first common cause we made with other animals were smaller predators than we are, because they won't eat us, right? So we have cats and we have dogs, the first animals that we domesticated. We rely on their superior senses, but it's an old contract. We make a deal. You do this for me, I do this for you. I'll feed you and keep you warm in the winter. So when you go to the SPCA, it's not the animal that broke the contract, it's the human. 
And you got to remember that. This is an old, old deal that we've made with these animals. And we need to honor it. Well, you've made a deal with, with your pack of 70 hounds that live with you. So how does that work when you, like in your, in your, in your farm, tea time farm, which someone told me should actually be called uh, Coke time farm. But, yeah, wow, well, uh, yeah. But on tea time farm, you have 70 hounds at least at, the, at this point. Um, tell me a little bit about just a normal day on tea time farm. Well, there are no normal days. I mean, <laughs> there probably aren't in your life either. But um, you're, I'm usually up at 5 o'clock, um, unless it's summer, and you try to get up even earlier because the heat, the heat comes up on you. But you, you got to feed the hounds, and I have a father and son who help me with that. And, um, and then i got to work them. It's called work them. You train them. You play with them. I mean, I'm there when they come out of the womb, so I pretty well know what I've got. But you work them, and you teach them to learn the horn, and you have to keep them fit, just like you have to keep yourself fit. These are not sports for people that are sedentary by nature. Um, and then you, you work the hounds, and then you go work the horses, you know. And, uh, and then you, if it's summer, you do that in the morning, and then I go in and write in the heat of the day. If it's winter, I do it in the reverse. But uh, what I had said to you earlier is people who are physically active tend to get more done. Tolstoy, rich as he was, and he was disgusting rich, farmed. And he went out and he cut the hay with the people. And other people said, oh, how could you do that, other aristocrats? And he always said, I need to do it. He did. Well, you know, you, you mentioned aristocrats. I think a lot of people could, like see fox hunting as a sport for the rich. But one of the things that I found as I looked more into fox hunting and read more about the books and seen these characters, some, yes, have a ton of money. Some don't. And it seems that there's like this sort of equalizing effect of this passion that comes along with fox hunting. Well, yeah, you can either stay on the horse or, or not, and money isn't going to help you. you know? <laughs> so it's pretty equalizing. But, I mean, there are people in my hunt club, I don't, know, I don't know how much they have. I know some don't have much because, you know, they'll help. They'll ask for hay or something like that. But, um, and I don't even know always who's married and who isn't. I don't, I don't pay the least bit of attention. My attention is really on the hounds and the fox and the horses. But it's a great equalizer. And uh, it always has been in the South, in the old days, um, of course, slaves hunted. And um, they were very often the best riders. So there's this, there's this deal in the South, and this is fox hunting all over. It isn't just in, in the South, but in the South, the slaves rode in the rear as grooms. The tradition of fox hunting is children and grooms always ride in the rear. But in the South, the rear was all the slaves. And, um, you know, if master or somebody had a problem, they had to come up and help them and this and that. And I don't know if you know, but the first three or four jockeys of the Kentucky Derby, the winners were black. And so the white boys couldn't stand it. So they created this law so that uh, uh, young black men couldn't be jockeys anymore. All of that's done for, thank God. But um, in a way, again, equality. If you could do it, there you were. George Washington's huntsman was a slave. And he loved him. He was one of the few men he'd really talked to. And I don't know if the huntsman loved him or not, but I bet he did. How could you not love George Washington? And by the way, George Washington was the only president who owned slaves who freed them upon his death. Others talked about it, but Washington did it. You have a great love of history, too. You've written about Dolly Madison, but you've also like done, in our conversations in the last you know, six hours, there's been so many historical references. Obviously, it's a, it's a big part of your life, too. Well, they're still here, and we're here because of them. You want to know some real good stuff about Dolly? She had such a rack. You could put a dinner plate <laughs> on it. You could have eaten your meal off of that. And this was when women wore empire gowns. Oh, honey, she knew how to work it. I'm telling you, those boobs preceded her in the room by two minutes. And all the men are like, ah! you know, and... Uh, Oh, God, she was great. Do you know she died in 1849? And remember, our population was far, far less than it is now. And it remains the largest funeral in our country's history. Yeah. People came from all over to say goodbye to Dolly. I've not, I've read a lot on Dolly Madison, but I've not read a lot on Dolly Madison's rack. And so until tonight, I get well, to talk about it. <laughs> I tend to dwell on the really important things. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. You know, this is, a, this is another thing, girls. This is aging. You know it's going to affect that part of you, too. <laughs> you just have to deal with it. I just love the fact that I got to say Dolly Madison's rack, and it was freebie. I didn't get in <laughs> trouble for it because you said it first. 
Um, you know, one of the things, your hounds all have personalities, and I, I wanted, as I read their personalities, I wanted to know if all your 70 hounds, or however many you have, if you can really kind of perceive different, that many, all the different personalities, and do you know them all? Like well, sure, that? and I know their voices too, but it's the same with people. I mean, you know more than 70 yeah. people. Yeah. You can identify them. Um, maybe some you may not wish to, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I do. I love them. I'm, I'm happy with, uh, in a lot of ways, I'm very primitive. I live in this moment, and so do the, my animals. People are always, I mean, I love the past and I love history, but people are always fretting about the future. You know, you know it's that old line, uh, 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 the, what is it? The future is what's no, the, today is what's happening when you're worried about the future. Um, people, people just cast, I don't know why they're looking for trouble or why they're looking ahead. Look, every bad thing that you think is gonna happen to you probably will, sooner or later. So the point is not to avoid it, just to be strong enough to overcome it. And then share it, of course, or inflict it upon somebody else. <laughs> I mean, that's the real way to go. I mean, no, really. I mean, I'm assuming most of you were raised in the church and some of you the temple. So we were talking about this a little early. You know the Ten Commandments. Okay, you know the Ten Commandments. So you can't, you know, say ugly things about somebody and thou, thou shalt not kill. But there's no commandment that says you can't get on your knees and say, Heavenly Father, please take this to your bosom tonight. <laughs> See what I mean? I mean, come on. <laughs> I'm a bad Christian, but I'm too old to be a good anything else. I'm, I'm trying to find every way around it. So your, you know, your, your love of animals, it's funny. Some people are either dog lovers or cat lovers, and the battle rages on. You're an everything lover, it would seem. Um, I'm not sure how, if there's any animals out there that you don't love, but you're, you love cats just as much as dogs. I love, yeah, I pretty much love everything. When I was a little kid, I was always the one that would save the skunks and the squirrels and the possums, and I would have them for pets. And my mother, my mother actually was part and parcel of all this. She always helped me because she loved them too. But, um, and I could always kind of get them going, you know, patch them together and get them going. And then, you know, then there's this little kid walking around with this possum following it. People would just like, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. And I said, well, you don't look so good either, you know? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, you're, you're one of the only authors that I know that has a, an animal as a co-author. Um, you know, Sneaky Pie is like, like these, these books have, I don't know how many, 24, 25, 26. Or it's these becoming things. infinitesimal. Yeah, and it's a cat that co-authors, I don't know how you work out the royalties agreement with the cat, but it's, it's been a very good partnership for you. You know what? This is what gets me. People think they're so smart. I have never gotten anyone to give me the best seat in the house to feed me when I'm hungry, and to call me what a beautiful, dear, sweet little thing. And every one of you that has a cat is doing this. <laughs> you know? So who's the smart one here? And this whole thing with a cat, this, it actually started during the writer's strike. Um, I was working in Hollywood. And in Hollywood, when you make the money, it just comes in like a tidal wave. There's no preparation for it. You can't imagine it. And uh, then all of a sudden, it stopped. And uh, the Writers Guild went on strike. And it was, it was a really good strike. It was one we should have done. Over, they could see the new technologies emerging and knew we would lose money if we didn't get residuals from it. Um, so we were on strike for almost nine months. And it was, it was really hell. You couldn't work for anyone. They couldn't work for anyone. But if you remember Moonlighting, they actually did a, a show about it, which was funny. Uh, that was a good show. It was a well-written show. Um, so my cats you know, sees the bills coming in and says, you should write genre fiction. And I'm like, huh, I read Latin and Greek. I'm not writing genre fiction. I'm not descending to the suburbs of literature, you know? And then more bills came in, you know? And I thought, well, maybe she's got a point. It was great. It kept me from being a literary snob. I mean, it really did. It humbled me. And I started to read mysteries, which I had never read. I had no interest in them. And I found some of them are really brilliant. I mean, the early ones is plot. You know, like um, Agatha Christie. It's, they're all fabulous plots. The characters are pretty much cookie-cutter characters. Then you get to somebody like Nao Marsh, the New Zealand writer, and it bumps up a little. And then you get to people like today, like P.D. James. That's the real stuff. Yeah, for uh, sure. I thought, hmm. But you, you, you moved into genre fiction like you move into so many things. You, you created your own space in there that wasn't already occupied by anybody. I mean, there's people playing around with animals and things in some of those genres, but you created this cat space for yourself, and then you went and said, you know, I really like fox hunting, and I think that there's a place for fox hunting mysteries, and boom, you're, you moved into that. 
in each case, you basically invented a, a subgenre for yourself that takes into consideration all the things that you love. Makes me sound so smart. I, I like that. <laughs> if you're going to go down there, is my yeah. point, you might as well make it work for you, you know, around the world you love. Pretty much, I always, I always kind of do what I want to do. That's just my nature. I don't sit and worry, are you going to like it or are you not going to like it? I just, to me, life is just a big frolic. Doesn't mean I haven't had pains and losses. Of course I have. But what's the point of being here? There's this little, set, there's this little quote from Isaiah in the Bible. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. So, make a joyful noise, you know? All this wringing hands and worry and all this, you know, the writing about angst and all this and that. I would rather die first. Where does that come from? I mean, you, you were raised a certain way. It's your family stock, obviously, but where does it come from, this idea of, like, you know, make a joyful noise and don't, don't worry about anything? Well, my mother always said, everybody's got trouble. Shut up about yours. <laughs> <laughs> I think she was right. But I really do think we have an obligation to celebrate this incredible chaotic, confusing, terrifying, majestic life. I mean, do it now. You're going to be dead a long time, you know? I mean, what's the point of being here if you don't get something out of it? And, and if you aren't enjoying it with other people? Um, and, and a lot of people don't. A lot of people, I, I, I don't know, I think they need guilt to feel that they're a good person. And I look at guilt like Jews invented it, Christians refined it. <laughs> <laughs> I have some questions about guilt. <laughs> There, it's joyful, you, you live that joyful life, but yet you've also pushed against the boundaries of things. There's been um, sometimes anger-fueled and injustice-fueled, and you've always pushed. You've always pushed into spaces that, that you felt you needed to be in or that you felt other people needed help getting into. Okay, here's the deal. Does the Constitution just apply to some of us, or does it apply to all of us? I believe it applies to all of us. Therefore, there should be no racial discrimination, there should be no gender discrimination. There should be no anything. The door should be open to everyone. I can't give you any talent. I can maybe give you the tools, but at least let everybody have a chance to make it, to keep people away from things because of irrational criteria that they can't control. And now it's getting flipped, like everything's testosterone poisoning. Every time there's aggression or whatever, it's some incipient, deep male evil, as though no woman ever knocked the crap out of anybody, you know? <laughs> Um, I mean, this, this stuff, it's just, first of all, it's tedious, and secondly, it's trashy. So you either love the Constitution or you don't. And if you love the Constitution, if you see injustice, you fight. Because there's always people that are going to try to take it away from you, including the president. I mean, the presidents all try to whittle it down so they can get more executive power. And of course, Congress at this point, I mean, never have so many been bored by so few. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, I'm not sure they're smart enough to take it away from you, but they can try. But be before we get into politics, let me just m make one statement. The difference between the Republican and the Democratic parties is the difference between syphilis and gonorrhea. <laughs> Once you know that, you're okay. Why anybody in this audience would believe anything either of those parties says, you're smoking opium. I'll stick to my Coca-Cola. <laughs> so you, you know, your early days of sort of experiencing life meant sometimes getting kicked out of things. You got kicked out of the University of Florida, where I you did. were living at the time. Um, we'll get to now and getting sort of the boot from now and, and some of the leaders of that. But let's start with um, when you first left Florida, when, what was it that got you kicked out of the university? There were um, seven... It was the beginning of integration, and there were seven black students, and they put them all together in one dorm. They didn't mix them with the rest of us. And there were a couple of us that said, you know, this really sucks. This is wrong. And two of, the, two of them were twins, the Harmeling twins. So the way the administration at that time got rid of us, I was easy to get rid of. They just yanked my scholarship. So I was out. That was the end of me. Um, but the Harmelings had money. And they couldn't just throw them out. So they put them in the eighth floor of the J. Hillis Miller Health Center, which was the, the, the floor for people that were mentally ill. And the one hung himself. To this day, the University of Florida has never taken responsibility for what they did about race, for what they did to him. Uh, the brother is alive. He survived. And the other woman in this group, Judith Brown, survived too. 
But I look back on that, and those were terrible days. People did terrible things, and it, it wasn't even that much power. I can understand doing terrible things for millions and billions, but this is just so they could stay running at school in plain words. I mean, at this point in our history, University of Florida was not known for but so much. Um, it's, a, it's a much, much better school now. Uh, and, and FSU had just uh, transferred from being a normal school to a school for, for boys. So, I mean, the mindset was about this big. And as all this is going on, the Charlie Johns Committee had just wrecked through Florida 10 years before. And it was, this was a committee to find wrongdoing in our school system. Homosexuals, communists, they destroyed lives. And I think, you can st I think you can read about the Charlie Johns Committee. They've finally been open about that. Um, what year was the Charlie Johns I think that was in the 50s, uh, the middle to late 50s. So all of this is colliding and everything's building on one another. And um, I mean, I, in a way, I was lucky they threw me out. Uh, and I went to Broward. At that time, it was a community college. It was just new. I mean, literally, it was just it was sand spurs. It was a bunch of buildings in the middle of sand spurs. Now, now it's a university. So I could keep studying and, and um, then apply to NYU, because NYU had the best pla classics department in America at that time. Is and that why you were attracted to New York for yeah. the classics department? Yeah. Not for the energy or the, you know, the, there's like a larger game happening there in terms of the protest Oh, there's energy everywhere. And... You don't have to be in New York. I mean, it's OK. But New Yorkers think they're the center of the universe. They're welcome <laughs> to it. They're certainly welcome to it. Um, and I got a lot out of New York City. I, 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 I owe the city a great deal. Um, not as much as I owe Pittsburgh, where I was in an orphanage. I owe my life to Pittsburgh. Um, but New York, I learned a lot. I learned Yiddish. I loved it. What a great language. Oh, God, it's so pungent. I mean, you can say the worst things in the world. You know? And it sounds really bad, too. It's wonderful. Um, it's really wonderful. <laughs> But I, I again, I learned a lot, and I'm glad, I'm glad all that happened because it did get me to NYU. And I studied Greek under Blue Mattrell. If you look her up, she died in 1996, and she got a one-page obituary in the back of The Economist. She had a huge obituary in the London Times and the New York Times. And was I her best student? No, not at all. But I studied with the best. And the same with Latin. I studied with great people. And it, it's gotten me where I am today. I mean, it's the basis of our culture. Why wouldn't you want to know it? I mean, the world did not start when you came into it, you know? And I always wanted to know, how do we, how do we become who we are? And it seems to me the quickest way is to learn language, to learn, because you think you speak English, but you don't. English speaks you. Because there's things you can say in French that you can't say in English. There's things you can say in Greek. Greek is really complicated. When you learn Attic Greek, you understand why it was the language of philosophy. In one sentence, you can say two conflicting ideas, and it works. You know, we can't do that. Well, nobody can do that. But, um, but I wanted to know, and I did know. And the language took me home. It did. And I thought, OK, I know who we are. I know what we are. It doesn't matter if you're French. It doesn't matter if you're Portuguese. It doesn't matter if you're from South Africa. This is our base. This is the entire base of Western culture. It's worth fighting for. And you know what? Our kids have to know it, because I guarantee you, those people in ISIS, they know their culture. Why would we turn our back on what we really are? And we have people in the world that have pride in a culture that beheads people. I mean, how are we going to fight these things if we don't know who and what we are? Democracy started with us. It didn't start with them. It didn't start with the Chinese. It didn't start with the Chinese. It started with us. Shouldn't we be a little proud of it? Or are we supposed to make arguments about, well, you know, that was a bad time and women couldn't vote? We had to evolve. I mean, I mean look, evolution is the hope of the immature. <laughs> but we evolved to where we are now, where we've opened, we've opened the process to many people. You have the ability. To, to economically thrive, but it's there in the very beginning of our culture. It's in the beginning of the Iliad. You, you were taught the Iliad the wrong way. The Iliad, Iliad is an anti-war tract. The first great work of Western literature is anti-war. Why? Because Achilles turns to Agamemnon and says, why should I kill Trojans? They didn't do anything to me. You're a bad leader. Read the Iliad again.
It is not what you read in school where it's taught as a celebration of war. If anything, it's the, quite the reverse. And most of it is not about fighting the Trojans. It's about, it's about what happens at the Greek camp. That's who we are. If you're going to lead, you have to be responsible. If you're going to lead, you have to take care of people. And you have to listen to what they say, even if you're a king. That's who we are. How do you think your uh, understanding of the classics that you're sharing with us right now influenced your own protests, your own anger, your own desire to push back? I mean, were they interrelated? Could you have had one without the other? No, I don't think so. I mean, I don't, I don't think I could have had it with the intellectual clarity. My mother was a political, a very political person. My mother started marching for the vote in uh, 1915 when she was 10. And we got the vote, as you know, in 1920. And it was my mother that impressed upon me We've marched for this for a couple generations. Your great-grandmother marched for this, and some of the men in our family marched for this. You're going to vote, and you're going to be involved in the political process. And so in ways I have, and in ways it shocked her, some of the things I did. But then she would come around, and she'd say, you know, I thought about it, and you're right. We should not deny these things to anybody. And I learned, I learned a lot from my mother. Let, let me tell you, one of my mother's great, th these are the things I learned. Oh my God, I, my, my mother was so great. My great uncle was county commissioner of Carroll County, Maryland. My grandfather was county commissioner of York County, Pennsylvania. It was really mother that ran everything. So this is what mother would do. My mother paid off the doormen in Philadelphia and Baltimore to find out who was having affairs with whom. <laughs> so let's say you were giving, giving her difficulties on something she wanted to get through the county. She would say, Rich, honey, do you know, since that poor Suzanne, who has been such a, such a blue person, has come into your company, she has been revitalized. You have worked wonders with this girl. Well, Suzanne's not your wife. She's your mistress. My mother just let you know. She'd get what she wanted. <laughs> she never threatened, but you knew. Oh, my God, I better take care of this woman. I better do what she wants. The other thing she'd do is you can't bribe an official, right? So she'd make a bet with you. You couldn't lose. Mom really knew how the system worked. Yeah, but you, but, but you absorbed some of that clearly. All, I mean, all of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all of it. Um, one of the things I wanted to do in the women's movement would hear nothing of it. You have to realize the women's movement are these really lovely middle class and upper middle class white women, except for Flo Kennedy when, when it all started. I mean, perfectly wonderful people, and they deserve everything they've won, which is also for other middle class women. Um, and I said, do you really want to get the ERA through? You're not going to get it through. You know, this has to come from each state. You can't just make a top-down issue, which is, of course, what happened with abortion. And guess what? It's not solved. It will never be solved. It will be fought forever and ever because it wasn't done slowly through the people. That's the only way you can make things work in this country. And it's time-consuming. It takes a long time. And if you're in a hurry, you don't want to do it. So they, th they thought they'd get the ERA through. And I said, no, you know, there's Got, you got to work with these state houses. Well, you know, these were city girls and, and Yankees and all these people in the state houses. They were just a bunch of rubes and they were terrible and they were all sexist, et cetera. So what I want to do was go to some of the girls that I knew that were call girls and, and beautiful call girls, you know, not street walkers, call girls, and, and, and set them upon these guys and let them hook up with them. <laughs> there you go. You know, and then we'd have what we wanted. But they were horrified that I could think like that. <laughs> That's when I realized they didn't understand a thing about power. <laughs> power is not a nice game. You know, you don't get it by serving tea. It, it doesn't hurt to serve tea, but you got to get it. You got to have something on somebody or you got to hurt them. All animals understand pain. If you bring pain to your political rivals or enemies, they understand. They'll get out of your way. You don't want to hear that, do you? <laughs> so this was the group. This was the group in now, and, and now wasn't too fond of you either. No. Um, but you made a mark in now. There's some great stories, like the lavender menace story is great. But I'd love to hear a little bit about your because you were right there at the very beginning with um, with Betty Friedan, and then later with Gloria Steinem. And I think that that early days when you were just in the beginning of that, um, they didn't want you to stick around. I think of it as now what. And by the way, you all know Karen DeCrow died 
one of the presidents, she, she was a good president years later, a lawyer. Um, again, these are white middle class people and they have a certain view of things and they actually believe in, in lawyers. You know, where I come from, you don't lose lawyers, you use guns. <laughs> You, know, you, you get even in a variety of ways. The lawyer, the lawyer means you're a wimp if you have to go to a lawyer. You know, best to settle things yourself. But they didn't come from that culture, obviously. And, uh, and they all wanted to argue. And they wanted people to like them. And I'm like, isn't this like Lenin wanting the St. Petersburg Times to write nice things about him? This is not the way it works. So they got very disenchanted with me and threw me out. And I was, I think I was 22. I was the youngest person there by that time. Or maybe I was only 21. So that was okay, you know. Were you feeling like when they threw you out that you, were you frustrated, were you sad? Did you, did you immediately go off and find some other group? Or did you just say, peace out and move on? I was relieved because they were boring. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to say that either. All this ideological stuff and writing papers and left wing whatever. And I read Marx, I read Schumpeter, I read Keynes, I read all of them. And I think Marx is a fur bearing animal myself. Have you had your Marx today? <laughs> Don't forget to put your Marx on, honey, when you go out, it's snowing. I thought, how can you believe this stuff? This is not the way the world works. But they were people, if it was written down, they believed it, you know? And again, I come from a completely different world than these people do. I like them, I respect them, I think they've created a great movement for other middle class people. People of color are not served. People from Hispanic culture are not served. The poor are still poor. My state of Virginia is the best managed state in the union. The Wall Street Journal always gives us the number one thing for what? Bef after World War I to today. It won't get it this year because of McDonald. But um, in my state, one out of 11 children has slept on the roads, on the streets. What does this say about our culture? Isn't this a problem for everybody? Or is, are those the children of poor women and we don't care? I mean, I, I ask these uncomfortable questions. And people don't like me for asking them. But I'm like, I don't really care about another lawyer. I care about getting these kids off the streets. You know, I don't, I don't even care if they grow up to vote Republican, if that's what you're worried about, <laughs> you know? Just feed them, take care of them. But I mean, obviously, I'm somewhere else. And I wanted to start halfway houses, and I wanted to start places where you could get food cheap, and all that kind of stuff. But nobody wanted to listen to it. They wanted to write papers, and they wanted to, you know, I guess be in front of the TV cameras. You mentioned, though, um, that you did like Gloria Steinem, who was very good in front of the TV cameras. Gloria, Gloria worked at CBS before she became a feminist. She was in her 30s when I met Gloria. And she was just sort of inching over to some of these ideas that were very revolutionary. So she finally accepted them. I always, I'll still tease her. I say, you know, Gloria, you were a latecomer. Um, <laughs> she was the best thing that ever happened to us. She's beautiful. She photographs well. She's articulate. She can speak to things without being threatening. And, uh, and, and a lot of men were threatened. Them. I have no idea why. I cannot imagine why a man would be threatened by feminism. What do you have to gain by these irrational, this irrational oppression of women? It takes too much trouble to control a woman. You can't control them anyway. You know? How many of men can control their own wives? Give it up, brother. I mean, come on. I mean, just silly. Just total silliness. Um, but she was great, and she, she sees where they went right. She sees where they went wrong. We don't always agree, but she gives one a respectful hearing, and she was terrific. And there were people that were upset because she was beautiful, and they'd say, oh, she got where she is because of beauty privilege. Well, it didn't hurt her, but she got where she is because she's brilliant. And she knew how the media worked. That was her background. And uh, she, she really was the best thing that ever happened to the women's movement. And the women's movement now, or any of these movements, I mean, they're all in a state of, what do I want to say, incomplete leadership. And uh, the next generation of really driving leaders has yet to come forward. And a lot of people may say, well, we don't need to do this anymore. These issues are solved. We'll run for governor or whatever. But um, those were interesting days for most people. They were not interesting for me. I was away from everything I loved. I did it because I felt it was my duty, because that's the way I was raised. But I can't say that I really liked any of it. Look, I'm from Virginia. I want to have fun. You know, I want to laugh. I want to dance. I want to ride. I don't really want to talk about your boyfriend. 
I don't want to talk about how you think being a woman is terribly oppressive. I think if you're a woman, you're lucky. What are you complaining about? And so, that was another attitude they couldn't get, like, why are you complaining? You know, that what you're talking about are political problems. There's nothing really wrong with being a woman. Well, that's sort of what's happening right now. The word feminism has taken on sort of a different meaning with the, uh, a lot of younger people now. In fact, some people, there's a lot of debate and discussion about the word. Like Beyonce put it behind her the other day and the big thing. And then you've got some people thinking that it doesn't apply to them. And some people think it just means like not shaving your legs and armpits and other people don't want to attach themselves to it. <laughs> um, so, and then you have like the Sheryl Sandbergs and the Lean In thing, or you have Lena Dunham. You know, you have sort of these different sort of viewpoints of what it means to be a woman today. What do you think has happened to feminism in this generation? And is it a good or bad thing? I think it takes three generations to make social change, and we're only at the second one for all of these things, for, for the race, racial issues and um, uh, for women, and also for men, because men are being forced to change. Men weren't meant to sit behind a computer and get a butt so big you can show a movie on it. You know? <laughs> That's not what the male uh -oh. body is designed we got, for. We got problems then. Yeah, I mean, w w I mean, I haven't done this to men. The, the, uh, the economy has done this to men. But it's like now we punish them for being men. Um, these are sort of perilous times. Y you saw the, the, the time issue about, uh, with a very beautiful transgender lady who's the TV star. Yeah. And it said gender's the last frontier. I think gender's the last trap. Really? Why? If you have to spend all of that time proving you're male or proving you're female, you just wasted your life. You are what you are. You're beautiful just to, like you are. I don't care if you're uh, a, a, a weedy little fella or a great big strong one. I don't care if you're a whatever. Whatever you are, you're perfect just the way you are. Why do you care? Why are you making the cosmetics industry billions of dollars? And now they're, sending this, they're selling this stuff to men. I can't believe men are falling for it. You know, I always thought they were smarter than that. Um, you know, the, all the cream and the this and the that and what you have to do for your eyes. And I'm like, get over it. Shave and put aftershave on and walk out the door, brother. I mean, what? I mean, I understand why women do it because men fall in love with their eyes. Women fall in love with their ears. I get it. But, I mean, the other thing is I can never quite get is men carrying a purse. Sorry. I know I'm sexist. I never said I wasn't. But I really don't want to see a man carry a purse. So there's a lot of people, though, that, that, that struggle with, like, it comes so naturally to you to say these things and to believe these <laughs> things. And it's just part of your fabric and your DNA. But for a lot of people, that's hard to say and hard to, like, you know, that your discussion about gender being the last trap and, and other people, they, they struggle with that. It's like, in, it's like part of the culture now, this sort of inherent angst and struggle. There's another way to look at it. All ideology seeks to take you away from you. Doesn't matter whether it's political, doesn't matter whether it's religious. The point is to take you away from you. Doesn't matter if it's gender, so that you're a little unsure. You don't come up to the mark. But if you follow X, you know, if, if you put money in the communion plate, or if you put money in the governor's campaign, you're okay. And the smartest of all are the religious leaders, because they're selling promissory notes from the future. They don't have to deliver a damn thing. <laughs> they just tell you, you do this, and everything's great. You know, and people believe them. I was raised in the church. I was raised high church, and I, I'm very grateful for it. I, I believe a lot of it. But I don't believe the ideology. I do not believe the Nicene Creed. I don't believe any one of you in this room is by nature sinful and unclean. Don't. And I don't believe any of you men in this room need to prove you're a man. Some man needles you and calls you sister or calls you whatever, and you're going to get mad about it. He's the putz, not you. You know, don't give him a minute of your time. Or if you do, knock the crap out of him. <laughs> you know, I, what is this anger management stuff? Knock his teeth down his throat. <laughs> you know? That'll be the last time he says anything. Um, but the same thing with women, you know, oh, am I this, am I that? You're fine. You're just fine. There, they, there are truth in each of these ideologies. You need to study them. You need to find out what works for you. But don't ever let anybody get, the, get you thinking you're not quite right. Because then you're a victim. And you've got a great big V here. I know you, you may not want to hear these things, but this is down-home talk on the front porch looking at the Blue Ridge Mountains. 
when it all comes out. And I am, I am always amazed at how wonderfully bright people can give themselves over to others who have no concern whatsoever for their welfare. You know, you, um, my wife read something that you had said that really struck with her, because my wife's a stay-at-home mom now. She, um, she used to work uh, and did so in Washington in a really busy environment. She read something, though, that you had said about Virginia Woolf in A Room of One's Own and how difficult it is, and if there's anything that maybe feminism can be of this era, that it's finding that, you know, that, that tough balance that doesn't make, it's different for a CEO of a company who's a woman or something than it is for the woman who works as a waitress who has a job, you know, f you know 50 or hours a week and has to come home and has a child. And, and men, you've always said, have been able to find the space they need to succeed, whereas women are constantly balancing with the tug of those children if they have them. And um, you had talked about A Room of One's Own and that really struck her as like this really powerful thing. And it was really validating for her because she's struggling with this all the time. And um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that sort of balance and how it's maybe changed even from the old days to now. There's a real simple way to look at it. There was a time in the feminist movement where women were told you can have it all. You can't. This is just, this, no. You cannot have it all. But you, you can't have it all at the same time. Ultimately, you can have it all, but you have to do it sequentially. And I think uh, for men, having children, of course, completely alters their life. My dad said, no man becomes a man until he becomes a father. Daddy really believed that. Um, I don't know whether it's true or not, but it certainly was for him. So there, there are great shifts that a man makes when that happens, but he has to work. That's one thing we've got to realize. This country is still very sexist. A man has to work. He dies in the traces. He has no way out. A poor woman has no way out either. She's got to work. But anybody ab above that, a woman can take some time with her children or she can have a job as opposed to a career. No man ever has that choice, really. And um, it makes it difficult. I mean, we know the time lost when women ha are raising their children, the, you know, the, uh, what is it, the, the retirement funds and all this kind of stuff. And I, don't, I really don't think there's an answer to that. If you have the children, they're your first priority. I mean, why have them otherwise? And somehow you and your husband or you and your partner have to work out how to do this and still earn a living. And when I was a kid, men were terribly cheated. You know, you saw your fathers late at night or you saw them on the weekends and you didn't really know your father. A lot of people didn't. And so these men, the one thing I've seen in men of my generation and men that are older is they, when they die, they weep that they didn't know their children, that they didn't get to spend that time with their children. And I think, no, you really didn't. You know, so, so you, you got to look at everybody's, everybody's contribution in this. I mean, people saying, well, men have it easier because uh, the woman devo devotes herself to him. Yeah, in some ways she does, but he devotes herself to her too. He's literally working until he dies to pay for everything. Doesn't that count for something? You know? Um, so I look at all these things and I think there were a lot of issues that feminism didn't address just because of the anger. And it was so vulgar, the way women were treated. For instance, I was up for a, a Woodrow Wilson scholarship. And, and when I went in, they listened to me. And then when I stood up to go, they said, well, you know, you're going to get married and we're going to waste this scholarship on you. I didn't get the scholarship. I mean, any woman out here can tell those stories of a certain age. So the, the mistreatment was so obvious and, um, and I think we're through most of that. But I don't think we will ever figure out how do we, how do we create a fair, borrow FDR's word, a, f a, a fair deal for everybody. I don't know that you can. I think any relationship that you're in, there's give and take. And sometimes you're given 90% and he's given 10. And sometimes it's the reverse. And we don't want to, I guess, look at that. There's no such thing as a 50-50 relationship. Or if you've got one, you, well, then you're one of the few. I've, I certainly haven't seen it. But somehow people work it out. And there's no rules. You know, there's, there's no rule for how you have a marriage or how you have a partnership. You work it out. I just pray you have a sense of humor because you're going to need it. <laughs> and, you know, then there's books, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, all this kind of stuff, which just confirm the stereotypes in the worst possible way under the guise of getting you to understand one another. 
What's there to understand? It's another human being. Listen to him. You know, have him listen to you. What do you need to know? Number one, I mean, I, I know I'm probably not being very nice, but, but, but I'm, I'm old enough to have seen a lot of this now, and I just think we need to get a little realistic about what and who we are. That seems to be um, a, a theme that I see over and over with you. You were right in the middle of a lot of this stuff. I mean, you lived it, you were there, you were there for the inception of a lot of it. And for a lot of people who are in it, like whether it's a movement, whether it's civil rights, or whether it's, uh, I told you this backstage, whether it's um, um, anything, any movement of any sort, when you're in it and then you have some distance from it and you look back on it, you start to put sort of like a round sheen to it. It has a glow um, to it and it takes on a larger than life quality. For you, it seems like there's still sort of this unvarnished truth about what really happened there, even though you were right there in the center of it all. You don't look upon it with a, that sort of, you know, longing remembrance where you're building it up into something even bigger. It's, it feels truthful and you're, you're often critical of it. I did it because I had to. I didn't do it because I wanted to. I wanted to hunt hounds. <laughs> I wanted to write books. I wanted to, to just have a laugh. There was very little laughter among those ladies. <laughs> that was my first clue. Oh, I don't know if I can do this. You know? <laughs> they were all so good. Well, let's talk about that, because Ruby Fruit Jungle, which was sort of your entree into writing, um, and I had never read it. I admit when I read it when I knew I was going to be talking to you, and I, I didn't know how funny it was and, and the point. I mean, I, I guess I sort of knew, but it, I really laughed hard at it. I felt like almost Twain-esque to me, and like the character was really funny. And then I, I realize now I'm talking to Molly Bolt right now. But I mean, the, the point is like that story um, still resonates with so many. When you wrote it, um, it were you definitely just telling your story, and did you have any idea what it will become? I was just so damn bored with what was going on. I thought, you know, everybody says they're going to write a novel, and they don't do it. I'm going to do it. So I sat down and did it. You know, I was too dumb to be scared or any of that. So I did it, and I thought, well, you know, this is okay. This is kind of funny, you know? And um, couldn't get it published. Did you know you wanted to have, like, a series of stories, and did you have an idea of, like, the, how you were going to put no. it all together, or did it all just come right out and you just did it? No, I, I still do that. I sit down and it just comes out. But remember, I have a terrific base yeah. of Greek and Latin, and I've read an enormous amount of literature. I don't have to worry. I mean, that doesn't mean that what I write is good, but I don't have to worry. I know I've got, I know I've got access to what's there. Um, and I can tell you a little story for those of you that like literature. Um, and I, I would talk to the youngsters about this. What is the oldest story, one of the oldest stories in Western literature? The story of mistaken identity. Oedipus, mistaken identity. Over and over again. Or the fun of Shakespeare. I think Two Gentlemen of Der Verona is mistaken identity. But it runs through our literature. It runs through the French. This, everybody does it. It's just a great story. And the whole point is, when are they going to find out? What's going to happen? Of course, if it's Oedipus, it's terrible. If it's Shakespeare, it's funny. Dickens comes into our lives, this great and fabulous writer who could bring people to life as no other writer could, really. And he takes the oldest story, one of the oldest stories we've got, A Tale of Two Cities. Now, until A Tale of Two Cities, the whole deal is you have to unmask the identity, and that's the resolution, and it's funny. But in a tale of two cities, you, the reader, are praying. It never gets unmasked. So he took the oldest thing we have and twisted it. That's a great writer. Uh, not just because of the plot, but because of the writing. So I have all of these things to draw upon, and others don't. Others, others want to write their stories. It's not enough to write your story. You have to take everybody's life and somehow make it work. Because if you just keep writing about yourself, that's an exercise in narcissism, and none of us are that fascinating. <laughs> you know, or as, as Tallulah said, you know, um, what is it? It, it? It's difficult being me. Even I have trouble doing it. Um, <laughs> but you could apply that to literature. So somehow you have to move out into the world and see other lives and make them all work. And, and I always thought that was, that was the turning point for plots how clever he was. And after that, you'll see all kinds of twists and turns that you don't see before. Not just because we now have so, so many more literate people, so there's so much more stuff being written that couldn't have been written before because people didn't have access to the tools. You know, now more women are educated. Remember, we weren't educated for a long time except for the very rich or the royal. 
people of color have access to educations, et cetera, that weren't available before. So there's just an explosion of literature and stories, and some of it's really good. Um, I don't know, and this isn't, um, this isn't a literature, but Isabel Wilkerson, By the Warmth of Other Sons. That's a good book, really good book. So I want to go back. I'm, I'm writing down Elizabeth Wilkerson now, or Isabel Wilkerson right now. Um, but it was 72, 73, you've written this book. Nobody's publishing it, though. And um, you're, you're going house to house, I'm assuming, like they, people do, and, and it's not getting published. Somebody takes a chance on you. I mean, that was life-changing for you. Do you remember that moment and what it felt like? Yeah, they gave me $1,000. It was the Shamrock Oil heiress. And she had started a little publishing company, a lovely woman, June Arnold. And I think it was Shamrock Oil, but it was one of those Houston oil money things. And uh, she was married, she had children. And she started this uh, little company and she published five books and mine was one of them. And it sold 70,000 copies in two months and they didn't know what to do. They couldn't keep up with it. And um, so they, they hung on for a year with this book. And then they did a second novel of mine called In Her Day and they just couldn't handle it. So Bantam, which was a reprint house then, came and said, well, we'll buy this from you for $250,000. Well, they owned the book, I didn't own it. And um, June called me up and said, you know, we have this offer on this book. If we sell it, you'll be accused of selling out. I said, uh, well, I don't care. <laughs> Who's accusing us of selling it out? They all have, have enough money for dope and stereos. The hell with them. Um, <laughs> You know, so I said, sell it, you know. So she sold it, and she didn't have to give me a penny, and she gave me half. That's when I was excited. That's when I knew I had a shot. And then when I wrote my third novel, because you can, anybody can write a flashy first novel if you got a bit of luck and a bit of talent. It's, it, and the second one usually is never equal to it. You always get your face slapped for the second one. It's the third one that determines whether you're really going to be a writer or not. And that's when I sit down and wrote six of one, and I knew I got it. So you're off to the races after Yeah, that. I really am. And I love it. I didn't think I was, I don't mean I didn't think I was better than anybody or all that, but I thought, you know, I can make a living doing this. But that energy, that moment when you knew that like, okay, I'm, you had made this transition from being um, an activist into being a writer. Um, it, you had had the training, obviously, as you talked about, but that moment when uh, she split it half with you, um, did you, did you have the confidence then? Were you, were you like, this is, I, I see it. I'm seeing a path for myself. Well, this thing about confidence, let me quote to you my mother, Rita May, often wrong, never, never in doubt. <laughs> 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 so yes, I had confidence, you know. Uh, that's the same thing like the first time I carried the horn hunting. You know, people were, because when you carry the horn, it's all on your shoulders. And, uh, you know, people were, oh my God, you know, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. I just hunted my hounds and never looked back, you know. What are you going to do? Why worry? Yeah. What do you think about when you look back and read Ruby or, or you know, hear people talking about Ruby for the Jungle to this day? I mean, does it, do, you, do you think you were, that's my young self, I don't even think of that person anymore? Or what do you think about the book? I think I'm lucky. Um, I'm glad it still reaches people. I'm glad the humor reaches people. I am really dreary with there's a lot of sadness in life, but I really don't see any need to dwell upon it. Um, we all get through it as best we can. I mean, if you can make people laugh, I think you've done a lot. And, um, but I'm glad. I mean, a lot of times people are emotional and they'll, they'll say I saved their life. I didn't save anybody's life. I opened the door. They still had to walk through it, you know? And I'm, but I'm glad I opened the door. And, and, uh, and there's, you know, as we sit here, there's some kid in the middle of Michigan just terrified because he or she doesn't really know who or what they are and they're worried or they are they're gay and that's terrible or they're worried am I, you know, a, a woman trapped in a man's body or the reverse. You know, if you can give that person just a little room to find their way, you've done something. And you all do it, you know, you talk to them or whatever or you just say, you know, you'll, you'll get through this and... Yeah, it's not the easiest thing. There are a lot of people that are going to bust you for it. But you know what? If they don't bust you for this, they'll find something else. So just get through it. Did you ever have an uncomfortable, was it ever uncomfortable with your own family, with your own mom or dad? Are you kidding? My family, they're all wild as rats. <laughs> I mean, I'm the dull one in the family. <laughs> they didn't care. They could have cared less. I mean, they didn't really even read it. Mother read it. She had a little moment. 
She said, I'm not the mother in that book. <laughs> and I said, well, okay. You know, I never said you were. So then I thought, well, you know, I've hurt her feelings. And after all, she did save me from the orphanage and this and that. So I won't put her in the next book or put a character somewhat like hers. I didn't. She was furious. She didn't talk to me for a year. <laughs> so now your books have all sorts of people that are similar to the people that you hang around with every day. I'm sure they all think they're in your books somewhere. And you always tell them they are. <laughs> <laughs> and let them think which one. The human ego is inextinguishable like JFK's yeah. flame. So, I know that's me in the book. <gasps> How'd you find out? <laughs> that's really funny. So, you know, we were, we were talking a little bit about... Um, you know, people coming out and that sort of thing. And one of the, I've, I've seen an interview once where you talked about sort of the differences between men and women. And earlier in your life, when you went up to Columbia University and started the homophile... Student homophile student, league. Student homophile yeah. league. Um, it was mostly men and you. And there's, you said you saw differences in the way that people sort of uh, behaved and came out. And, and that was sort of a, clear, a moment of clarity to you about men and women. Well, I realized, again, I don't know... I, who knows what's genetic and what isn't and all this and that. And now there's all these fake bioscience books about, you know, what makes a woman's mind and what makes it. So nobody knows. Nobody's ever known. Believe me, if Socrates couldn't figure it out, we're not going to figure it out. Um, but what I saw is that the men were angry. They had more discretionary funds. And for them, the acting out was lots of sex. The rebellion all involved the sex act. So we'll have as much as we can and thumb our nose at everybody. Um, and uh, it was, to me, it was childish. I mean, to me, I, I, I didn't care about any of that. I mean, I don't care who you sleep with. Just you know, do it and shut up about it. Um, for the women, I understood they were doubly oppressed. They didn't have the money. They, they had very little discretionary income. And many of them had been raised with fear a fear that the men didn't really have. And, um, and that was difficult, getting through that fear. Uh, fear of being physically assaulted or harmed. Um, and for many of them, uh, the questions about children, can, uh, can I have children, will I have to The gay men never asked that. They didn't want to have kids. I mean, I think they were relieved of heterosexual male <laughs> responsibility, yeah. uh, a lot of them. Now it's different. I think now many of them are willing to assume the traditional responsibilities of men in our culture, but then it was just a joyride at that time. There was no political analysis whatsoever. Um, that came later, that all came later. Uh, and the terrible thing that made them wake up and actually develop a coherent thought about how to proceed was AIDS. They had to become politicized because of AIDS. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I mean, it, it, really, it wasn't as bad as the bubonic plague, but it was pretty awful. But it did have a silver lining. And of course, nobody ever looked at what AIDS did to gay women, which is, in essence, they became very young widows. Because I don't know any gay woman that does, doesn't love a gay man or have a dear gay best, you know, and the same with a lot of straight women. So it was early widowhood, but nobody's ever written or addressed what happened to women during that. Who nursed the men at the end? A lot of them, their families turned on them at that time. In the early 80s and the middle 80s, it was the women. So it was, a, it was th those were odd and difficult times. But again, we've learned a lot from them. We can never bring those people back, uh, but we can certainly honor them by what we do now. But that was, and, and the period when nobody knew how it transmitted, that was really wild. The theories that could be transmitted by mosquitoes, I don't know, you remember that? Yeah, I mean, there was a, it was almost like the Ebola concern and fear that you see right now. But. Yeah, it was crazy stuff. So you see um, a, a generation now, um, in some cases, sort of recessing from political activity and, and activism in some cases. Do you hear or see any voices uh, today that remind you of some of that, or do you, do you have any concerns if you don't see them? No. I mean, leadership comes when it's needed, really. Um, so, I mean, I think we just waited out. Right now, in some ways, our problems are the problems of plenty. The things that people get upset about, I mean, they have food, they have clothing, they have shelter, most people. Some don't, like those kids sleeping on the streets. But that's a small percentage of Americans. So now the problems are, you know, am I going to get a good job? Am I going to have a great career? Can I afford a mortgage? They're problems. I'm not saying they're not problems. 
But again, they're the problems of plenty. We're very spoiled people. When you can have people sit in judgment on one another about the kind of food they eat, I think you're a pretty rich society. There are places in the world where they would love to have your sugar, you know? But, but you know, now there's like a, a food movement in this country. Uh, but part of that may be that they feel they don't have any control, so the last thing they can control is their bodies. I don't know. I think about these things, but it does strike me as just a little bit off the path. Well, I'd love to, to keep talking, but I know they want to ask some questions, and uh, I'm, I've enjoyed talking to you. It's been a wonderful evening. I've, I could talk for you for hours, and uh, I'm sure I'm going to bend your ear a little bit more before we're done, but uh, I know we want to take some questions. The lights are going to come up, and we'll turn it over to some of our audience right now. Thank you, Rich. Yeah. And there's a microphone in the back, so anybody who has questions, um, raise your hand, and they'll pick you out here, and, um, and we'll go from there. Who has a question? Well, that means you just believed everything. <laughs> Hi, thank you for being here. Uh, Rich, you mentioned something about Norman Lear early. Well, so, what was your Norman Lear experience? Can you tell us that? Is there one? Go ahead. No, I worked I... for Norman Lear when I was in Hollywood. And uh, we did a show about the uh, First Amendment called I Love Liberty. And it was my first Emmy nomination. And uh, Norman, I think, is 90 now, still working, looks fabulous, full of ideas as ever. He, he was, I don't know if you know Norman's story, he was in World War II, he was in a, bomb, a, a bomber. The guy's got guts. Uh, but he truly believes in this country because he fought for it, you know? He's just a great guy. I mean, Maud. Do you remember the Maud when she turns 50? Oh, my God. Is that one of the great things? Or, or, you know, Archie Bunker and all this. And just, just, oh, it's, it's terrific stuff. Can I tell you an animal story? Okay. Maud B. Arthur was a very big woman. And she, uh, she had been asked to speak at the National SPCA, Thing. This was back in the 80s. And Betty White was always involved in these things, too. I think Betty was the one that got her to do it. And um, uh, like many actresses and actors, she's very nervous if she's not playing a part. She's very nervous if she has to be herself. And so she, she's back in the green room. And every time somebody would go, she'd say, oh, I'm so nervous. Would you please get me a drink? You know, so they'd bring her a gin. And um, so it comes time for her to get up to the podium. And she majestically walks across the stage and sweeps in the audience, as only a real actress can do, you know, as command. And she looks out at the audience, and she grips the podium, and she says, those poor little doggies and kitties. <laughs> <laughs> they had to remove her. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, though, Doug, uh, all this has been happening to me all night. I mentioned, yeah, we're going to be talking to Norman Lear in a few weeks for this other thing. She goes, oh, say hi to Norman for me. And I was like, oh, that's funny. She goes, no, he's a friend of mine. And then I said, yeah, I talked about Brian's song, this movie I liked, out of nowhere. And she goes, oh, I went to high school with Brian Piccolo. <laughs> now, he, was, he graduated the class of 61 from Central Catholic. And I was at uh, Fort Lauderdale High at the time, at class of 62. His thighs were like this big. And he was the sweetest thing. God, he was sweet. So just but we mention were, someone and she'll... she'll yeah, well, we were all there time. together. Diana Nyad, Chrissy Everett, myself, um, Brian, and then the best athlete of us all, which I was telling you about, was a woman named Betty Reiner. She was fabulous. She was in Brian's class at Central Catholic, but she became a D Dominican nun, which is why you don't know about her. <laughs> um, could you tell me a little bit about your... Uh, writing schedule? I know some people write a certain number of pages a day or a certain number of hours a day. What's it like for you? It depends on the season. You know, in the summers, I try to uh, ride and do the hounds in the morning and then go to work in the afternoon when it's real hot because I finally got air conditioning or broke down and did it. Um, and then in winter, it's just the reverse. Work in the morning and then go out in the warmth of the day, what little there may be. Uh, but I'm usually good for four hours, and then I wind up doing calls and this and that, you know, all the, the business stuff. But 
I can usually, you know, keep at it for four hours. It doesn't necessarily mean it's good, but you know, you go back and you read it the next day, and somebody says, well, you know, that's not too bad, and others like, oh my God, I didn't do that. The cat must have done that when my back was turned. <laughs> You know, we're, any life in the arts is wonderful. Whether you're the artist or whether you're, you know, like working for this thing, the, the National Writers, when it, when it, is that it? National Writers? Series. Series. But anybody that's involved, librarians, pe people in the theater, the lighting directors, anybody in the arts generally has a pretty full life. And, uh, and not, not everybody can do that, obviously. You all have to make money however you can. But um, the quickest way to understand a culture is through their language, through their arts, and through their sports. So people really reveal who and what they are, what's important to the culture. I mean, if you look at football, it's very American. It is so technical. And everybody's involved in some way, thinking they can outsmart the other guy. See, that's the great thing about fox hunting. You will never outsmart the fox. Can I get another one? Rita, you've always written nonfiction, but clearly you've had a colorful life. Have you ever thought about writing your autobiography? Well, I did one when I turned 50 called Rita Will. And uh, my publisher wanted me to write these things before I forgot them, which I thought was rather insulting. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I did it, you know, up to that point. But the problem with writing while people are still alive is you do have to pull your punches at some point. You can be much more truthful about the earlier stuff than the later stuff. And this is how truthful works for a southerner. Let's say I have an unmarried aunt and we're in the same family. I would say to you, oh my God, Rich, Aunt Georgette, oh, she's ugly as a mud fence. You know, and we chat about, you know, why Aunt Georgette was not blessed by nature. <laughs> but if I were talking about Aunt Georgette to you all, I would say, she's an unclaimed treasure. <laughs> so, once you do the thing, I mean, it, it, it kind of makes life exciting and wonderful. And here's something before, there's another question. I'm assuming most of you are Yankees. It's okay. But I, I feel compelled to tell you, I did not know damn Yankee was two words until I was 15. <laughs> but at any rate, if you throw around the F-bomb in the South, it's, it's not wise. Not because we're proper, or, well, we can be, but you know, that's a veneer. Um, it shows that you have no imagination. Why would you possibly want to say <laughs> when you can say something incinerating, original and incinerating? Let me give you an example. My mother was at the racetrack. We were in, we've been in horses since the 17th century, and it was a steeplechase race, and there was a, a, a man there who had come and he had a horse running and he was bombastic and he saw a group of attractive ladies and so he thought he would impress them and uh, about his horse and about this and that and what he knew and the ladies of course being Virginia, Virginia and Maryland ladies are listening mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and when he finished nobody knew quite what to say they wanted to they could have said F you but instead my mother said I shall have to find another occasion upon which to manifest my esteem <laughs> Get him! <laughs> and this poor guy was too dumb to know he was just socially destroyed in front of all these people. I mean, there's really a certain amount of fun to the vocabulary, expanding your vocabulary of abuse. <laughs> right down here? Oh, or up here. Would you please give us your author's perspective on the disappearing of books and the increase in technology in the reader's world? When it first started, the, the e-book onslaught, nobody really knew what to do in publishing and they made a lot of mistakes. I mean, I'm, I'm not responsible for administrations, but I can understand why. You know, nobody's prepared for a new technology and nobody understood how the young are imprisoned in a way by these devices, which are both good and bad. Um, like any device. So um, they drug their feet, they didn't have a response to it, and they began really losing sales. John Grisham lives over the mountain from me, and um, 
David Baldacci's up in Northern Virginia, which we call Occupied Virginia. Um, <laughs> and everybody's print runs are really dropping. I mean, those guys have had movies made, so they're always going to sell and they're always going to make money. But nonetheless, when, you've, you're, when you're accustomed to two and a half million book print runs, then you're suddenly dropped to 1.4. You pay attention. And nobody really knew what to do. So some people started their own websites and did these kind of things, which I think were some help. But what has now happened for most of us is that ebooks has leveled off to 30%. That sounds okay, and it is okay. But if you buy one of my books, I get $2. If you read me on ebooks, I get 30 cents. So we're all losing money, so to speak. On the other hand, I look at it, the audience is expanding. So if it means I lose money, but more people are actually reading, I'm for it. The only thing that worries me is if you don't know how to read a traditional text, you'll never be a good researcher. It's just like if you don't know penmanship, you'll never be a good researcher. Um, and, I, and I think the young uh, can be deluded into not understanding they still have to know the old ways. And there are still more people reading books. First of all, I love to desecrate a book. <laughs> because I can hear my mother's voice in the background. Don't you write in the margins, so I'm going to do it. You know? um, but they're, they're, and then another thing is if you ever pick up an annotated text. I mean, the Talmud. The Talmud is one of the first annotated texts. It's fabulous. So um, you'll never get that on e-books. You'll never get that on a computer, really. Um, so, I mean, people will have to figure it out. But it's leveled off 30% now, except for science fiction. Science fiction is still really going in ebooks. Um, most publishers now have deals with Amazon or they've created their own ebook and, and things. Romance. Yeah. Romance is flying on ebooks too. I don't get romance, do you? Well, they have like a lot of subgenres too in romance. Like I tried to read Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah. I saw a Victorian Brady Bunch era like a uh, subgenre in Victorian era Brady Bunch themed Miss, or romance series. <laughs> so you can find your any subgenre you want, but they're definitely cranking in ebooks because they read so voraciously. Well, also, if you're reading softcore porn with an ebook and you're a woman, nobody sees the back of the book. That's right. <laughs> See, women are still pretty sensitive to that. Yeah. Me, I don't care. But, um, but, it, but it is interesting. I, obviously, there's a lot of uh, uh, fascination with these things out there. Um, I mean, if, you're, if it gets you to read the book, my theory is maybe it'll get you to read another book, you know, and you'll keep going. And maybe you'll actually get back to T.S. Eliot or Turgenev or Tennyson, who's one of my favorite poets. He's not much read now. I mean, maybe somewhere along the line, you'll actually pick up a real book, you know, and you're like, oh, this is what it is. You get to talk to somebody that's been dead for 2,000 years, and they're in the room, and it's super it's just, I mean, do you, can you remember the first book you ever read where all of a sudden you're just knocked back? That voice is in your mind. That, those ideas are just exploding in your head. It's, it's just, it's one of the great moments of the life. Another way to look at this, if each of you made a note about the first book that you read that affected you, and then you went through to where you are today, you would see the map of your inner life. You would see the map of your emotional development. Nonfiction for your intellectual development, but for your emotional development, fiction, because fiction's all about emotions in one way or the other. And um, sometimes it takes a certain amount of courage to read these things because they can be very disturbing. And you don't necessarily want to be disturbed. But if you look at this, you will see periods of your life when you got fascinated with something. And then either you resolved that or you went on or whatever. And I often thought, if you really want to be a full American citizen, go back and read what the Founding Fathers read. They read Cicero. They read Seneca. And you see what influenced them, and all of a sudden it's like, I get it. I get where the Constitution comes from. I get why they were really concerned about the separation of religion and politics. That goes right back to the Thirty Years' War. You know, and you see this, and you see their lives, because they all had that same training. But, but you have it, too, in your way. But, um, but to me, that's, that's just, I mean, Jefferson is as close to me as my cousins, in some ways. Uh, Monroe, Franklin, all of them. And you realize that period 
in history will never come again. We will never see a generation like that. And it wasn't just here. There were people like that over in England. Edmund Burke, Reflections on the Revolution of France, the founding document of conservative thought, which is not conservative like you're thinking of conservative, like to the right of Genghis Khan, but a, but a, a way of looking at, at how people politically come together. And you read these things, and you, then you read Thomas Paine, who warns you, you know, when planning for future generations, remember, virtue is not hereditary. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, oh my God, this is all mine. This is every American's. This is what we get. We were born in the Enlightenment. We don't have to worry about feudal tugging the lock and all this kind of stuff that they're still pissed off about in England and other places. Well, I guess I, I don't know if I would be too or not, but we are so unique. And you know, there's been this bashing of America by Americans for the last 25 years. We were born in the Enlightenment. No other nation on earth has this history. Why are we going to kick ourselves in the butt for it? No other nation on earth has ever rebuilt a foe in war either. We rebuilt Germany and Japan. How bad can we be? I mean, do you know how special we are? I'm not saying always good, but how unique we are. And, if you, and again, go back and read what they read. Seneca alone is worth it. I mean, Seneca said, scorn pain, either it goes away or you do. I mean, how can you not like somebody like that? Oh, he's just a delicious cynic, you know, really. Why should, why should I get married? It's easier to hang myself. <laughs> Seneca. Anyway, I can go on forever, but I am just thrilled with what I'm not always thrilled with what we are in our political process at this moment, but I'm really thrilled with how we were born and how we've grown and how we've learned from our mistakes. The, the worst being the war between the states, obviously, it was the dumbest thing we ever did. We could have solved that problem three times over in our history, and we just kicked the can down the road. And what scares me is we're doing the same thing now. We're just kicking things down the road. So if you choose not to have that happen, it won't. Remember, Jefferson said, sometimes democracy must be nourished with the blood of tyrants. They don't necessarily tell you that in school. But there is the key. If you want to revolt, go do it. He's telling you, do it. If you can't find any other way to get through to the power structure, revolt. And remember, we revolted against the legitimate political authority. So every, every politician and president since that has a little bit of fear about it which is why they're so quick to tell you why you should believe them. And anybody that takes to the streets is, of course, on dope, crazy, whatever. No, it's in our history. If you want to take to the streets, you go right ahead. I'm not saying you should. I think you should try everything first. But it is actually quite American to be violent. <laughs> I know you're not supposed to say these things. The next thing I know, there'll be a federal agent here. <laughs> Speaking of federal agents, our hunt club gives a symphony. Every year we give a symphony. And this one year we had, um, a, uh, one of the pieces was about hunting, and a shotgun goes off. And this was down on the mall at Charlottesville. It happened to be the same night that President Obama was down on the mall. So all of a sudden there's this rush of Secret Service agents in, into the theater because the shotgun went off. It, it just, it's, I mean, yes, it's, these things can happen and presidents do get killed and, we have a lot, we've had a while since one has been done. But that, too, is part of politics. You don't take that job if you don't know what can happen to you. You know, there's always some wingnut out there, or there's somebody that actually may have a legitimate grievance and has no other way to address it. And you can demonize them and say they're crazy. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But if you're going to be a president, or you're going to be a senator, or you're going to be a government, a governor, suck it up. You ask for the job. That, that's wherein I differ from other people. You ask for it, you take what comes. You go to a party, somebody's going to come up to you with your grievance. And sooner or later, we're going to find the mistress you're keeping in, in Georgetown, too, <laughs> where our money is going. I mean, that's what gets me. If you're going to do it, don't be a hypocrite about it. Let us all enjoy it. <laughs> Which is why, you know, one of the happiest days of my life was the Monica Lewinsky affair. <laughs> come on, at last I was morally superior to someone. <laughs> I know, none of you would ever fall that low. <laughs> but if you do, tell me about it. <laughs> <You know? laughs>
<laughs> anyway, are, are, am I just rattling on? Is it time to shut up? I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Okay, I'm up. I'm up here. Oh, Whoop. We got somebody, oh, we got somebody upstairs. Oh, we got one up I'm here. I'm up here. Sorry. First. Um, Rita, I've enjoyed many of your books, all the different ones, all the different groups that you've had. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite was the one about, and I don't remember the name of it, about the woman who dressed as a man to be in the Civil War. High hearts. But yes, thank you. Um, but what I found it found interesting is you have such a great Southern voice, but you mentioned that you were adopted from the North, it sounded like. Well, and my, at what age? Because you have such a good Southern voice. No, my, we were Marylanders. Half of the family's Virginians, half was Marylanders. And my natural mother ran to a Catholic orphanage in Pittsburgh because it was far away. In those days, there were only two-lane highways, plus it was gas rationing. So she figured nobody would find me. Then she got guilty about it and went and told Julie Ellen Brown, who's related to her, my natural mother and Jutes, who you've read about in 601 and you know, half, you know, all the 601 books. Um, bingo. Uh, and loose lips sink ships. They have the same, their, their, their uh, mothers or sisters. So I'm, I got adopted back into the poor side of the family because my natural mother came from millions. They made millions in the thoroughbred business and in the standard bread business. Well, if I got adopted into the poor family, I can't inherit any of it. I don't care. I mean, I really don't care. What the hell? My grandfather taught me about horses, whether he gave me a dime or not. He gave me something better than, than money. And plus, my dad always said, Daddy Brown, he said, put your money in your head. Nobody can steal it from you there. So it was interesting. But so that's how I got s sort of the voice. It's an, it's an OK voice, but a beautiful Southern voice. Tidewater accent. That is the best. Ah, oh, wish I had that. <laughs> or Charleston. They're pretty good. You know, a Southerner can identify another Southerner the minute they speak. You know, exactly the location, exact yeah. reasonality. Because all of our accents sound different to us, whereas they sound the same to y'all. <laughs> and you know y'all is pure plural, yeah. right? OK. Uh, you have a volume button, though, with the accent, though. Like, you can really turn it up and dial it up, depending on who the crowd well, I can is. also hunt hounds. I, my voice has to carry for miles, and I can really do it if I have to. But. The South is a stage that has been unchanged in many ways since 1607. I mean, Virginia started this country. I think we have a lot to answer for. But <laughs> nonetheless, 1607, and my folks got here in 1622. But if you think about it, the South is a set stage. The culture is so identifiable. It's much easier to write a novel set in the South than it is set in Seattle. Because if you write about Seattle or if you write about Traverse City, you have to set this place for someone. And it's unique and it's different and it's going to take a lot of pages. And you have to do it in a way that isn't boring. But it's an extra burden upon the writer. I hope you do it. There's a good novel waiting to be written about this place. Any other questions? Uh, no? Well, we'll Wait, there's, is that a question? Oh, oh there's Jill. She's right behind, oh, he's right go. behind you. Are you the huntsman and the master both of the Fox Club? And how does yeah, that work? Yeah, I'm the work? huntsman and the master. And there, okay. there's some of us that do that. It's not all that unique. So you can do both jobs at the same time. I do. I do. I really love it. If, I wish I could have been a master as a young person. Because the political skills are the same that you need in Parliament. <laughs> and I mean, I, I think the two-party system is killing us. I mean, when I say that crack about Democrats and Republicans, I really mean it. And remember, when Washington left office, he warned us against party politics. He said, don't do it. So we now have two parties who put the control and health of the party above the United States. So if you get elected as a congressman from this district, if you don't play party politics, you aren't going to get money from your, for your next election, and you aren't going to get money from the, from the party either. For, or you're not going to get some of your bills through for this area. That's terrible. I mean, that inhibits people. If, you have, if we have parliament, we have a much wider representation of political thought. And the only way you can form a government is to build bridges. And we don't, we don't know how to build bridges anymore. And, and I lay that at the feet of the party. I don't necessarily lay it at the feet of individuals. I think there are a lot of individuals up there that are desperately frustrated 
and don't know what to do and keep thinking if they keep trying and trying and trying, it isn't going to work. But it isn't going to work, you know, with the head of the Republican Party and the head of the Democratic Party thinking only of the next election. 